I'm going to be talking this afternoon about a technology that transformed the music industry. That technology was magnetic tape. And surprisingly, this German innovation was essentially overlooked by Allied intelligence during World War II, ignored by the U.S. Army afterwards, and would not have been adopted by the music industry so quickly had it not been for a few persistent individuals. Now, more recently, we have witnessed the seismic shift in the music world. Computers, digital audio, and the internet have turned the music industry on its head. The effects of magnetic tape over a half a century ago had a similar effect, dramatically changing recording production techniques and allowing the musician an unprecedented amount of creative freedom. Now, some of you may remember my lecture from one year ago when I recounted the development of the magnetophone from 1935 to 45. I'll summarize a few of those highlights from that lecture and then focus on how this German invention changed the American record industry. And two specific areas I wish to explore are stereo and multitrack. In 1935, the German company AEG debuted their magnetophone at the Berlin Audio Fair to great acclaim. It was the world's very first tape recorder. It offered unprecedented features like 20 plus minutes of recording and the ability to edit and erase, making it by far uh, much more preferable to the traditional four minute shellac disc. Over the next 10 years, the magnetophone underwent fundamental improvements to both the tape and the electronics, making it by far the world's best music recorder. The Nazis utilized their innovation as a propaganda tool, both militarily and culturally. And the German Wehrmacht purchased over 2,000 machines for behind lines communications. German radio, which was headquartered in Haus des Rundfunks in Berlin, uh, used the magnetophone as their primary recording format, giving them the ability to broadcast cleanly produced performances of German music day and night. Now, fortunately, about 2,000 of these historic tapes, including about five stereo, have been recovered from the war. And these tapes are housed in their original home, uh, the tape archive of the Radio Berlin Brandenburg, which was formerly the Haus des Rundfunks. Many are available for listening online, and some have been released on compact disc. I'd like to play you now one selection from the archive, which is actually the earliest stereo recording ever made. It dates from April 26, 1943. You will notice the quality of the recording, which is pretty amazing considering it's 1943, and the fullness of the stereo image. And what they did was they placed three microphones across the stage to capture the expanse of the orchestra. If I walked in a room, somebody could fool me and say, you know, this was done last year, and I would almost believe it. Okay, uh, Allied intelligence completely missed the magnetophone during the war. Signal Corps personnel regularly monitored Berlin radio, but they couldn't figure out how seemingly live performances by the Berlin Philharmonic were emanating out over the airways at the wee hours of the morning or how Hitler could be making two different speeches at the same time. The answers came once the Allies had captured some of the German radio facilities. The first clues came on September 19, 1944, after they stormed and captured Radio Luxembourg. There they found these old machines that produced very good recording quality, 
A year later, similar machines with even better quality were discovered at an obscure radio outpost outside of, outside of Frankfurt. Now, the migration of tape across the Atlantic might not have happened so quickly were it not for a few important individuals. In the next part of my lecture, I'd like to tell their stories. Some of them failed and some of them succeeded. But they provided the fragile thread that brought a revolutionary technology, one that American enterprise and know-how could not provide, from Germany to America. And their perseverance ultimately changed the music industry forever. The first person I'd like to mention is an Army colonel named Richard H. Ranger. Ranger grew up in the Midwest, and he came east to study at MIT and the New England Conservatory of Music. After World War I, he worked in electronics for RCA and was responsible for creating the trademarked NBC chime town, which we've, at least those of us who are old enough, have heard for decades on radio and television. Now, during World War II, he served as a colonel in the Army Signal Corps in Europe. And at the end of the war, he wrote a very detailed report on the magnetophone, entitled Fiat Final Report Number 923, which indicated he had an intimate knowledge of this machine. Upon his return stateside, Ranger immediately began building and selling his own professional tape recorder, the Ranger Tone, which was based upon a magnetophone that he had brought home. There's a picture of his machine. But Ranger had only limited success. He did manage to sell a handful of machines to smaller studios and radio stations in the New York area. But he did make a significant contribution to the awareness of magnetic tape on the East Coast by demonstrating and lecturing on the topic. Now, our next individual is John Herbert Orr, who is really an unlikely candidate for a place in history. He grew up in Alabama on a farm and never finished his degree at the Alabama Polytechnic Institute. He then drifted from job to job with eventual employment with Delco, and later he found himself in Europe working as a radio technician for the Psychological Warfare Division of the Army, where he got a first-hand look at these new German tape recorders. Now, the next story I'm going to tell you about has never really been verified, but it's such a good story, I have to tell it. Apparently, the Allies had plenty of used magnetic tape on hand following the capture of Radio Luxembourg, and they decided to put it to use for an Eisenhower radio speech. At some point in the broadcast, Eisenhower's voice drifted off and was replaced by the voice of Adolf Hitler, which the machine had failed to erase. This embarrassment caused Eisenhower to order that the Army never again use German-made tape. So John Herbert Orr, of course, caught wind of this. And being a pure businessman, he was never one to pass up a good opportunity. After the Eisenhower fiasco, he realized that there could be a big demand for magnetic tape. So he became involved in the rebuilding of the original BASF tape plant in Ludwigshafen, and he later befriended a retired IG Farben employee named Carl Flaumer, who supplied him with detailed ingredients for making magnetic tape. And it is a very complicated process. In a garage outside of Wolfen, Germany, he began manufacturing his own quarter-inch tape stock for the Army. After a wartime injury, Orr moved his operations to Alabama, where he founded the Oradio Corporation in 1949. And for years, he competed with 3M and other tape manufacturers for the booming new tape recorder business. Now, if you're as old as me, and I hope none of you are, you might remember the Irish tape box from that era. I can see Eric is smiling. Um, Oradio was a very profitable and, and sold such an excellent product that Ampex Corporation actually bought them out in the late 1950s. Now, probably the most significant and important person in the transfer of tape technology to the United States was a Signal Corps sergeant from San Francisco named Jack Mullen. In the summer of 1945, he discovered a bunch of magnetophone K4 machines in a small radio station 
in the town of Bad Nauheim, north of Frankfurt. And after hearing their amazing quality, he had two tape transports packed up and shipped, along with 50 reels of tape to his mother's address in San Francisco. Mullen spent the next few years experimenting with and improving these machines while working on sound for film projects with his business partner, Bill Palmer. In 1946, he publicly demonstrated his machines at a meeting of the Institute of Radio Engineers in San Francisco, which caused a major sensation. News traveled fast via trade magazines that a brand new recording technology confiscated from Nazi Germany was about to explode. And suddenly, Mullen's services were highly sought after. Ampex, a Bay Area manufacturer of wartime communications equipment, immediately contacted Mullen for a private demonstration and subsequently hired him as a consultant. And then people from Bing Crosby Associates in LA also caught wind of these developments. Now, Bing Crosby, especially for those who are younger, was a famous singer entertainer who preferred to record his weekly radio shows during the day rather than have to come in to the studio at night. His team was looking for a recording technology that could replace the really bad sounding discs and allow their star to pre-record and edit the shows prior to broadcast. In August 1947, Mullen recorded the first Philco radio hour for the ABC fall season. There you can see a picture of Mullen with the Crosby producer, Murdo McKenzie, and they're looking over his tape machines. And I'd like to play you now a segment from the, this very first recording. You'll hear Bing Crosby ad-libbing, as he liked to do, in front of a live audience. <laughs> Hiya, fellas. Well, Bing, hey. hello. Oh, welcome home. Hey, wait, thanks. Uh, give me a hand with this, will you? Huh? Who was that? Your brother, Everett? No, no, that's a moose. <laughs> he followed me down from Canada. Steady now, boy. Whoa, now. Steady there. Whoa, now. A moose, eh? Uh, where's Everett? He's outside, strapped on the fender of my car. <laughs> hey, hey, Bing, you made it just in time. Oh, Look. good. I live and breathe. Here's my guitar player, Perry Bodkin. What are you doing over at that mic? And what am I doing over here? Oh Perry Big Body. Ad lib, I'll get over there in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, someone waits for me not you now the spontaneous interchanges you just heard were of course easily edited out with uh, a tape recorder and then this was first broadcast edited on October 1st 1947 and then Mullen went on to record and edit the first two seasons of this show. Now, after a few months, Crosby and his ABC affiliates in LA and New York became so enamored with this technology that they placed initial orders with Ampex, giving the company seed money to ramp up production for the first professional American tape machine. And there's uh, a list of some of the machines they came out with in the the end of the uh, 40s, and you can see an ad there. That's what ads looked like back then. By the end of the decade, Ampex had cornered the nascent professional tape market, and with each successive generation, they managed to improve the quality and have the price. Their early clients included radio stations and studios in the larger media markets of Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. Now, many historic pop recordings were made on these early monophonic machines. In 1950, Muddy Waters recorded Rolling Stone for the aristocrat label of Leonard and Phil Chess in Chicago. And in 1951, Jackie Branston recorded his song Rocket 88 at Sam Phillips' studio in Memphis, often acknowledged as the very first rock and roll song. Now at this point, the main advantages of tape were higher fidelity, 
longer recording times, and the ability to edit a performance. But other capabilities were about to be added, which would dramatically change the way records were being made. Now I need to pause now for a moment to briefly discuss the consumer market, which by the end of the 1940s was really starting to grow. Many electronics companies that had been selling wire recorders during the war now looked to this new tape format to expand their consumer market. The first company to offer a tape machine was the Brush Development Company. And as early as 1947, they sold a recorder called the Sound Mirror, which used paper-backed magnetic tape. The problem with it was that it used to break a lot. Other companies soon followed, selling smaller, more portable machines, which used the acetate-based tape that 3M, Aradio, and others were manufacturing. And in 1949, a company called Magnacord built a consumer stereo recorder originally designed for General Motors to conduct spatial analysis of automobile noise. Now, several minutes ago, I played a German stereo recording from 1943. In the United States, no one knew of these German experiments. But there was a common understanding among engineers and audiophiles that magnetic tape could lead the music industry into newer areas. I'd like to now play you the first known professional stereo recording made in the United States. It's from a January 25th, 1953 concert of the San Francisco Symphony at War Memorial Auditorium. Two Ampex employees recorded this as a test for their new two-channel machine released later that year. And this is an excerpt from Beethoven's The Creatures of Prometheus Overture, and it was recorded with two space microphones, about like these speakers are placed, in front of the orchestra. And what it does is it yields a very wide and expansive stereo image, um, more so than the 1943 Brahms recording that you just heard. One year later, RCA made the first stereo recording for commercial release using their own custom-built machine. It was produced by John Pfeiffer with the Boston Symphony Orchestra under the baton of Charles Munch. And this is now an excerpt from Berlioz's Damnation of Faust, which was recorded on February 21st, 1954. And you're going to hear really wide stereo here. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear very clearly that the basses are in the left side and then uh, the strings are separated. This should be fairly evident. <laughs> Thank you. 
1950s, RCA and other labels like Columbia, Decca, and Atlantic compiled large stereo archives of their recordings. A few things were actually released on consumer reel-to-reel -reel tape, but they really weren't officially available until the stereo LP was introduced in 1958. At RCA, it was advertised under the moniker of Living Stereo. What's kind of interesting is that stereo really didn't become part of the popular music world until another 10 years. So you don't start seeing stereo LPs of um, popular music until 66, 67. Now I want to play you a very brief video of a sound engineer, Tom Dowd, who worked for Atlantic Records, and Ahmed Erdogan, who was the president of Atlantic, talking about these early days of stereo. When it came to recording jazz, we recorded it simultaneously, two track and monophonically. It didn't cost any more than a reel of tape to record stereo simultaneously with mono. This meant that we were building up a stereo library before stereo discs had been invented, before people even knew what stereo was. Stereo came in, all the catalogs had been recorded mono, so that there was kind of a, everybody made a fake stereo. But we were able to start with true stereo earlier than any of the other record companies. Now, while stereo became the passion of classical and jazz audiophiles, another tape technology was looming. This was multi-track. And it became the darling of popular music. With two, three, or four channels available on a tape recorder, a musician could play different parts at different times and then mix them all together. This is still the fundamental concept behind all popular music that is recorded today. Now, before we talk about multi-track, we need to introduce Les Paul, a jazz guitarist who grew up in the Midwest and started his music career in Chicago. Aside from being a great musician, Paul was an electronics wizard. He was never really satisfied with the amplified hollow body guitar. So he built the first solid body, which he called the log. After the war, he became a backup musician for Bing Crosby. And with Crosby's support, Paul was able to convince Ampex to give him a prototype two-track machine for his home studio. He immediately began tinkering with it so that he could record a guitar or vocal part on one channel and then copy it over to the other channel while playing a new part. He called this practice sound on sound. I'd like to play you a sample of a sound on sound recording from the early 50s that Paul made with his wife Mary Ford, who was the singer. You'll hear many layers of guitar and voice parts, which he created by bouncing each track from one channel to the other along with a new accompaniment. three parts in each instrument, three guitar parts um, and, and vocal parts as well, which he had sort of built up on this two-track machine. Now, by the mid-50s, many studios were using three or four-track machines, but they had no ability to overdub, so all recording had to be done at once. On a pop or jazz session, common procedure was to record the rhythm section on track one, 
the melody parts, that is strings and horns, on track two, and then an instrumental or vocal soloist on track three. This gave the producer the flexibility to rebalance the music through mixing after the session. Now, some of the earliest multi-track recordings done in this way featured some pretty amazing artists, like Elvis Presley, Duke Ellington, Sonny Rollins, and Sam Cooke. Now, let's get back to Les Paul for a minute. Paul worked closely with Ampex to come up with a way to record separate performances directly onto individual channels. But this was a difficult engineering task because the heads on a tape machine, you can see an old machine there, are staggered, creating an inherent delay between what you hear on playback and what you record. And you can see there's the record head on the left and the playback head on the right. And what you hear in the headphones while you're playing with it is going to be offset with what you're actually recording. So eventually, Ampex came up with a cell sync head design, which solved the problem by embedding a small playback head within the record head. In 1957, Ampex delivered to Les Paul an eight channel tape machine, which was the first cell sync multi track allowing overdubs. Paul called it his octopus, and it enabled him to make records in a completely different way. So to illustrate this, uh, I have a short video here of both Tom Dowd and Les Paul speaking and commenting on these early days of multitrack. And I've included as a subtitle um, each of their names so that you can follow which one is talking because their voices are pretty similar. We had a great deal of respect for Les Paul. I was born in 1915. My name is Les Paul. I was in awe of the fact that he was playing three, four, five guitar parts and his wife was singing three harmony parts and they had the quality as high as they did. And I couldn't determine how technically they could do that. They hadn't thought of the way to use the tape machine where you could use it for all the things that they're doing today. They couldn't see that. And that amazed me. This is an artist in the, in the 50s doing what people are doing at home in their garages today with computers and so forth. But he was doing it in the 50s. And nobody knew what he was doing. And I fought for the studio in my home, in my bedroom, in my kitchen in my bathroom, everything. Hello, friend. <laughs> and I look today, and where are they? The kid today is in his bathroom, he's in his bedroom, and he is making his record in his home. I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And it got down to the fact that he had an 8-track machine. This is the octopus, and this is the monster. He was storing information on the tracks and then putting it back together. And the 8-track was there you go. the dream come true. <laughs> oh, boy. Not only could Artie Shaw come in and play his part later, we come a long way, or play it 10 times over to get it right, that you could separately bounce these things and do these things that it could not only be 8-track, but on to 24-track, to anything you wish. Whole new art form opened up. One, the art of capturing things on 8-track and how to use the 8-tracks, because sometimes we only employed three or four. Well, hey, let's add, make this twice as big or add two more people singing on this thing. All of a sudden, we're overdubbing. We're going out of our boards. We're crazy. Now, the second Ampex 8-track built was, of course, ordered by Atlantic Records and Tom Dowd in New York. Um, once they heard about it, they had to have it. And this gave their audio engineer, Tom Dowd, the ability to do all the things that you just heard him talking about. Now, multitrack now dominated the industry. And in retrospect, it seems a bit odd that most studios stuck with three and four track machines, almost for an entire decade. But I think this was true for two reasons. An eight track recorder was too expensive to purchase. 
and to maintain. And two, a few facilities had mixing boards, uh, did not have mixing boards that could accommodate eight channels. Even the Beatles, who had access to the latest EMI technology, had to record their Sgt. Pepper album in 1967 by ping-ponging between two four-track machines. And it's ironic that the Beach Boys, one year earlier, had used an Ampex 8-track machine to record the album Pet Sounds, an album that Paul McCartney said was the greatest rock record ever made. Perhaps because they simply lived in California. Now, by 1960, both stereo and multi-track production were a big part of the audio industry. It enabled artists to perfect their music to the point where their recordings became more than just real performances, but instead works of sculpted sound. This coincided and led to the idea of the concept album and eventually reached its peak in the 70s. Now, I'd like to play you uh, in, uh, as a conclusion, a really fun piece of music. This is uh, the song Let the Good Times Roll from the Genius of Ray Charles album. And you'll hear the orchestra is clearly divided in two sections. You'll hear mainly the rhythm section, drums, piano, and bass on the left side, and then more of the melody instruments and horns uh, in, on the right. And you'll clearly hear that the vocals, which I'm pretty sure were overdubbed by Ray Charles because they have a nice clean sound with reverb, uh, was recorded separately and then mixed in the center. So here it is, and thanks very much. some fun you only live but once and when you're dead you're done so let the good time roll I said let the good time roll I don't care if you're young or old you ought to get together and let the good time roll don't sit there mumbling talking trash if you want to have a ball, you got to go out and spend some cash and let the good time roll now. I'm talking about the good times. Okay, thanks very much. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to take those questions now. Um, if you're curious about anything I might have omitted.